This is a recording showing uh, me working Genetics 1 and Genetics 2 problems. Uh, you'll need to follow along with the problems from the worksheets, and um, there are many different ways to work these, but this is kind of how I logically go through the process. So in Genetics 1, the first question is about albinism in humans, and they tell you that albinism is recessive to the allele for normal skin pigmentation. So what you always want to do is to um, write down what your alleles are. So in this case, our albinism is recessive, and we'll just call it normal pigmentation, is dominant in this case. The question then says, if two heterozygotes have children, so these are the parents, heterozygous, what's the chance that the child will have normal skin pigment? What's the chance that the child will be an albino? And what's the chance that a normal child will be a carrier of albinism? So um, you might know off the top of your head this is a monohybrid cross, which is a you know the one to two to one, three to one ratios. But if not, we can do our Punnett square. And then we say, and um, what is, how many of these are normal? So for our normal, we're looking for uh, a big A. It's going to give us normal. So we have one, two, three of these boxes normal. So the chance, and they ask us what's the chance, which is a fraction. The chance of having a normal child is three out of four. The chance of having an albino child is just this box here. So that's a one out of four chance. And then this is the only part that's kind of tricky about this question is they ask you, What's, if you have a normal child, what's the probability that child's a carrier? So here's um, where you have to pay attention. They tell you you already have a normal child, so that means for sure your child does not have little a, little a genotype. So that leaves you with these three boxes left here. And so you just have to figure out how many of those are carrier boxes, two of them. So you have a two out of three chance, if your kid's normal, that that child's a carrier. Remember, the whole thing with being a carrier is that carriers always look normal. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be called carriers because they would be affected. Problem number two says, in purple people eaters, one horn is dominant and no horns is recessive. So let's write that down. I'm just going to continuously use A's for the most part. You can use whatever letters you want to. A's are just easy because you can actually tell the uppercase and lowercase pretty easily from each other. So um, one horn's dominant and no horns is recessive. Show the cross of a purple people eater that is heterozygous for horns, there's a heterozygote, with a purple people eater that does not have horns. So to have no horns, it's a complete dominant scenario, so we have to have two little a's. Write the expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios. Now with this, we're not doing fractions. The ratios are the ones where you put the um, uh, colons in there, and that's going to tell you uh, this many of this type to this many of that type, etc. So let's look at what we have here. In this case, um, we'll notice that this parent can produce big A um, gametes or little a gametes, so that's where the top comes from there. Uh, this parent can only produce little a gametes, so I just write one of those, otherwise it's redundant. You can write two, but that's all the options there are. 100% of the gametes are going to be little a from this person, or this purple people eater, I should say. So there's our cross there. So what's our genotypic ratio? The genotypic ratio is um, one of the big A little a's to, it's very important you make those colons big enough for me to see, one little a little a. The phenotypic ratio is what they look like. So here we have one offspring that has a big A little a, so that means it's going to show the dominant, which is one horn. So for every one, one horned purple people eater, we expect one no horned purple people eater. And so those are our genotypic and phenotypic ratios. 
Genetics 1 number 3 says in humans, the brown eye, and they designate this as B, so the brown eye allele is dominant to the non-brown eye allele. Uh, it also notes that eye color is actually quite complicated and not well understood yet, but we're just going to simplify it. If two heterozygotes have a child, what are the expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios of their offsprings? So we have two heterozygotes. This is a monohybrid cross again. Um, if you got the hang of this, you might recognize what the or the proportions are going to be for this. But if not, we'll do our cross. So each this one parent here can either give big bees or it can give little bees. The other parent can give big bees or it can give little bees. So then we get the possible offspring and we can look at their ratios. So genotypic ratio means the letter combinations, the alleles. So we have one big B, big B. For every two big B, little Bs, two, one, little B, little B. So that's the ratio we expect for genotypes. And for phenotypic ratio, we expect, um, in this case, brown eyes is completely dominant. So all these are going to get brown eyes. So that's three brown eyes for every one non-brown eyes. So that's our genotypic and phenotypic ratio there. Classic 1 to 2 to 1, 3 to 1, showing us complete dominance. Question number 4 is discussing seals, um, and they want to know about whisker length. So they tell us the W, big W, is dominant allele codes for long whiskers, and the little W codes for short whiskers. And remember, you notice I'm putting the line over the little w so that they're very distinguishable from each other. What percentage of offspring would be expected to have short whiskers from the cross of two long whiskered seals, one that is homozygous dominant, and one that is heterozygous? And they ask us percent short whiskers is our question is how much percent short whiskers. All right, so in this case, we could do a pun and square. So this parent only gives big W's to the offspring. This parent has two different options. It could give a big W or a little w. So now we have um, these genotype outcomes, but all we care about was what percentage are going to be short. So if we look at these and we look back, long whiskers is big W. So Big W, big W is long whiskers. Big W, little W is long whiskers. So that means 100% of our offspring should have long whiskers, which means our question asks what percent has zero. So we're expecting 0% of the offspring to have short whiskers from this cross. Question number five and question number six are the same question. They just want you to work it in two different ways. So question five um, is talking now about two different genes. We're looking at the Y gene and the Y gene codes for a yellow color of pea plants, um, or yellow colors of the seeds, and the little y codes for a green color of the seeds. And then we have T's. Our big T is going to code for a tall plant, and our little T is going to code for a short plant here. We do a, um, we're going to do a dihybrid cross, so parents heterozygous for both traits, which is what a dihybrid is. Heterozygous for both traits are crossed and they want to know what the, um, using a 16 square pun and square, determine the frequency of the four different phenotypes. So when we're looking for frequency, we're looking for um, fractions, how often you expect to see the different phenotypes. And so you won't, we need to report the genotypes, just the phenotypes. Okay, so how would we go about this? Um, so here's our cross. I just moved it up here smaller. And um, if we look at each parent, we need to figure out what kind of gametes they make. So each gamete has one Y and one T in it. So one option for the parent could be making a big Y, big T gamete. Another option is a big Y, little T gamete. Then we have a little Y, big T, and a little Y, little T. So that's one option here for that parent. Turns out the same options are for the other parent because they're 
it's a uh, situation where they're the same genotype. You don't have to draw them in the circles. I'm just emphasizing that these are all gametes. In this case, there's 16 different combinations. Not every dihybrid cross, well, I should say not every cross with two genes has all these, but dihybrids do. And then you just move them together. You say, what if this egg and this sperm, this egg and this sperm, were fertilized, um, then you get two big Ys and two big Ts. And if you go through this whole thing, then you get um, 16 different, well, 16 genotypes, some of which are the same, some of which are different, and you have to go through and figure out what phenotype matches that and count them. I'm going to fill the rest of this out, and I'll come back in a second. Okay, so here's our filled out pendant square. I'm going to shrink that down for us. And then we just need to figure out phenotypes is what we care about this time. So what kind of phenotypes we can have? We could have a pea plant that has yellow seeds and is tall. We could also have a pea plant that has yellow seeds and is short. We can have pea plants that are green and tall and green and short. So let's look at what kind of genotypes you need to get these phenotypes. So in order to be yellow with the complete dominance, we just need a big Y. Anything else will be um, will get us yellow. So a big Y and something. To get tall, we need a big T and something. For um, Now you could write out all the different combinations, but it's really more likely you'll miss some and mess up. So just do it where you leave the blanks because there's more than one option that can get you yellow. In the end, it's going to be much better to do it that way. So again, to get yellow, we need a big Y. To be short, though, now, short is the recessive, so that's going to mean two little t's. To be green, that's two little y's, and tall is a big T and something. To be green and short is two little y's and two little t's. So then we go to our pendant square, and we see which boxes fulfill those genotypes. So let's look for any ones that have a big Y and a big T, and we'll mark them with a dot right now. So big Y, a big T, at least one of each. Can't have more than that. And it's kind of takes some time. It's faster, a shortcut way, but we'll do this way first. So we should have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eight, nine boxes that fulfill this yellow and tall. So nine boxes out of the 16 are yellow, get you a yellow tall plant. So then let's look at this yellow short. So we'll mark yellow short with a um, square. So anything with a big Y and two little T's. So big Y and two little T's, big Y and two little T's, big Y and two little T's. Well, that's three out of 16 of our boxes give us a big Y, two little T's. Then we can mark um, two little Y's and a big T that gives us a green tall plant with an asterisk. So here's two little Y's and a big T, two little Y's and a big T, two little Y's and a big T. Again, that's three out of 16. And then our last one we'll mark with an open circle, all littles, which only one out of 16 boxes of those. So this is our probabilities. In the end, we wanted to know what's the frequency of different phenotypes. So there's a 9 16 frequency of yellow tall plants, a 3 16 of yellow short, 3 16 of green and tall, and a 1 16 of green and short plants. If I ask you to do a ratio of ratio phenotypes, that's when you do 9 yellow tall dot dot 2, 3 yellow short, 2, 3 tall, green tall, 2, 1 green short. In this case, I wanted to know the fractions. So you can work a dihybrid cross like that, but it takes some time. So there's a lot, there's a much faster way to do it. And this only works when you know that genes are not linked, it means that in this case, the Y gene does its own thing and the T gene does its own thing because they're on different chromosomes. So we'll do the same cross we just did before, the dihybrid cross, but instead of working a 16 square Punnett square, we're just going to work two Punnett squares. So the idea is that you can take the Y's and just cross the Y's. So it ends up being a monohybrid cross in this case. 
and you can take your T's and just worry and cross your T's. So again, in this case, big T, little T, big T, little T. And so um, just to remind you how that goes, each of these parents have two different types of gametes they can give. It gives you four different combos. And the same goes for the T's in this case. Now, it's not going to be like this every time. It depends what parent you're crossing. So you still have, you have to pay attention um, as to what outcomes you have. Um, now we have these boxes, and now we can look at what each of them gives us. So we have uh, the yellows. Remember, the big Y is yellow, and the little Y is green. So we have how many yellow boxes? One box, two box, three boxes. So three out of four probability of being yellow. And then the green is our little y, little y box. So there's only one out of four of those. Then for our T, so big T is tall. You can see one, two, three out of four chance of being tall. And then A to be short, we have a one out of four chance of being short. All right, so to find our phenotypic ratios, let's write down what we can look like. So we have some plants that could be yellow and tall. We can have some plants that are yellow and short. Some plants that are green and tall, and some plants that are green and short. Um, and then we can do the same thing like we did before. And we say, what do you need to be yellow and to be tall? To be yellow, you need a big Y and something. And to be tall, you need a big T and something. Now this is when you go over to what you worked in your little individual Punnett squares. So what's the probability from these parents to get us a yellow? So we already figured out that's a three out of four. We can just look at our boxes. So three out of four boxes will get us a yellow, a big Y. So that gives us a three-fourths probability of getting a big Y. And what is about our big T? When we have three boxes out of four that gives us a big T, so that's a three-fourths probability of getting a big T. Multiply those, three times three is nine on top, four times four is 16 on the bottom. So we get a nine sixteenths probability that will be a yellow tall offspring. Yellow again is Y, a big Y with something. Short this time though, to be short you need two little T's. So probability of being yellow again is um, these three squares here. So three out of four chance of being yellow. But now our um, Little t, little t is they're short, so there's only one fourth chance of being short from this cross. So that's three on top and 16 on the bottom. In order to be green, green means you are homozygous recessive um, for the Y gene, and tall means you just need one copy of it. So the probability of being green is one fourth, and I got that from here or here. And cross with the probability of being tall is 3 fourths, so 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 4 is 16. And then to be green and short, you need all little letters. So the probability of having uh, green is 1 fourth, the probability of being short is 1 fourth, 1 times 1 is 1, 4 times 4 is 16. So you end up with exactly the same thing you did on the previous page. It took me like, you know, maybe 3 minutes less time. Um, to figure that out. So this is a way that you want to do it if the two genes assort independently, they're on separate chromosomes, then this is a much better way to work pun square than doing the 16 square or some large group of it.